Dames Point is a little town on the East Coast that at one time was considered picturesque. Despite this, not many people make it a habit to visit due to the unwelcoming nature of the few that reside there. Maybe it's the salty air, the golden beaches, or the wooded hills that roll on forever that keep the townies around. Or maybe it's a darker secret, not spoken of in public, that haunts this town's past and keeps the residents as prisoners. It has been whispered in some circles that Dames Point, once a thriving fishing in Port Town, fell on hard times around the turn of last century. Whatever caused this is unknown and only speculated. Some talk about a pirate's curse. Others mention voodoo spells and witchcraft. Some even go as far as to say it was an ancient race of dark mermaids. That the mayor's son had once been lured in by one of these creatures and made a vow he never kept. Since then, the town has known nothing but despair. Most sensible people overlook these tales and assume it's a town that had run its course with bigger cities such as Charleston, Baltimore, and Boston taking over its business. Whatever the case, it didn't matter much to me. I had been assigned by the state auditor to go there and assess the decline of the town. It had been over a hundred years since anyone had taken an interest in this place, but due to new revitalization programs enacted by the governor, someone had to do it. Upon entering the town, the first thing that caught my attention was the rundown appearance of the place. There were holes in the steep-pitched colonial roofs of the houses, an old industrial complex from which steam poured out of greasy canneries, leaving a foul smell in the air. To be fair, everything outside of the town was postcard perfect, but once inside, it was like a trip to another dimension where building design froze in the early 1900s, but entropy continued to march on. There was a road going north to south that ran straight through the sleepy village, once part of an old highway system that fell out of use once interstates were built. Yet one more reason why this place was in its severe state of decline. From this old highway, other roads spiderwebbed off and throughout the city. At one point, this place had about 50,000 people living in her. Now it was down to 3,000 at most, my first stop was at the local hotel, where I was going to drop my bags before making my way to the one corporation still in business there. J.K. and Sons Fish Cannery had been operating since the late 1800s, but while still active, they didn't do much business in packaged foods under other corporations' names. The hotel was dilapidated like the rest of the town. The clerk's mahogany desk was as greasy as the air. A thin film of filth coated the reddish-brown wood, making it sticky and almost black. Behind the desk sat a man with thinning hair and a pale complexion. His eyes were slightly bulging, and his lips so swollen they appeared that they could burst at any moment. He wore a tank top that had been stained brown by sweat and barely covered his portly body. Without making any small talk, I introduced myself and asked for my room key. Despite his ghastly appearance, he was soft-spoken, if not somewhat feeble-minded. His speech slurred a bit, not from intoxication, but from being slow of thought. Eventually, I got to my room and settled in. The bed was clean and the accommodations adequate. Whatever care was put into the rooms was not put into the rest of the hotel. After lunch, which fortunately I'd brought with me, I walked the short way to the office building. Some of the houses lacked doors, which at first I thought meant that they were abandoned, until I saw a family in one of them eating a meager meal, and the dim kerosene lamplight that filled the place, I could make out that they were dirty, disheveled, and unkempt. The kids had filthy faces and were dressed in rags. Poverty hung on the place like a limp dish rag. There was a gas station and a small convenience store that seemed to be the only shopping place in town. I assumed most people drove the 30 minutes to the next town over for any major purchases, but the lack of cars in town would have said otherwise. Most of the buildings were vacant and at one time probably fine stores with quality merchandise. On one window I could see the old stenciling for a toy store, another had a marquee for a clothing shop. The insides were now dusty and had cobwebs hanging from the ceiling. 
At the wharf, the smell of dead fish was overpowering. Flies buzzed all around and rats scurried away from my approach. The office of the owner, who was JK's son, his name was Artemis, was in the back of the building. There were maybe a hundred employees on shift at the time, which made me wonder what the other ones who lived in town did. I won't bore you with the business talk we had about the proposed plans and loans from the governor to update antiquated equipment in the cannery. How the governor wanted to make her state competitive across all fronts and ensure small businesses had a chance to compete with larger corporations with small business subsidies and low interest loans. I will tell you that Art only met my speech with contempt and a look of loathing in his piercing gray eyes. With hands tucked into a spotless white suit, he made clear in no small terms that me and my help, nor the government, were wanted in his town as he called it. Based on the outside appearance of the building, I would have assumed he was going to welcome me with open arms. The inside of his office was another story, however. It was immaculate in its appearance, the floor spotless, his desktop sparkled the reflection of the sun outside his window. There was even ivory trim inlaid into the teak wood desk. Not to mention the stench from outside somehow didn't make it into the room. There was a complete disconnect inside the place from the outside surrounding it. I was scheduled to meet with him for two days, but the conversation was over in a matter of hours. By the time I left, it was only a little after three. There was plenty of time for me to drive back that day and not have to spend a night in the tiny rundown town whose stench was sticking to my skin by this point. I got back to the hotel room and checked out, went to my car to find that it wouldn't start. Come to find out that the battery was gone, not dead or unserviceable, but completely vanished. I tried to use my cell phone but had no coverage, so I went in to use the phone at the desk. The man at the desk told me the phone was dead and had been for some time, but he did offer to go get a mechanic to look at the car. It took over an hour for them to get back, and the mechanic told me that he had a shipment of batteries coming in the next day, that if I waited at the hotel that night, he would get me going first thing in the morning. That didn't sit well with me, but I left my bags in the lobby and told the clerk that I would be back for them in a bit. During that time, I went for a walk around town, desperately trying to get some kind of cell service. Up and down the main road I walked. Then, when that failed, I went throughout the small town, hoping beyond hope that I would get a signal so that I could get out of there as soon as possible. The whole time I was walking, I could feel eyes staring at me from inside each abandoned building. It was as if the whole town was watching me. On top of one of the many hills, I found a house unlike all the rest. It was in good repair with an iron fence around the lot. The yard was green and on the front porch there were large wooden pillars supporting a balcony. It had the appearance of an old plantation home from further down south. It gave me chills to see such luxury in the otherwise squalor of the town. I could almost hear the faint echo of screams and whips around me. Something wasn't adding up about this town, or Artemis, who I suppose this house belonged to. It was like there was some kind of spell on the people below, but up on this hill one could rise above it. Halfway down the hill and a quiet whistle caught my attention. A hand waved to me from the woods calling me to someone behind a tree. Suspicious and hesitant, I carefully made my way towards the whistle, my hands half raised and ready in case I was attacked. Mister, mister, you gotta get out of here, a man's voice said to me from behind the tree. They don't like outsiders here in town. Get out before it gets dark. Wha what do you mean, they? I asked. The bosses. If you don't leave before dark, they'll trap you here like everyone else, the voice said. Who are these bosses? I work for the governor. This whole town is suspicious. If you tell me what's going on, I can get help. There's no help here any man can give. It's best you go. My car's dead, and there's no phone service. How am I supposed to get out? Walk if you have to, but not to the main road. They watch that at night. Go through the path behind the big house. 
If you see the torches, it's too late. Go, and fast. I can't turn a blind eye to this. If people are being held here against their will, I have to do something about it. There's nothing on this earth that can change what has happened here. And to tell you the truth, all of us deserve it. But if you're here after dark, the bosses will think you're one of us. They don't discriminate. Let me get this straight. The people here have bosses that only show up at night, keep them here, and if I'm caught here at night, I'll be forced to stay as well? This sounds crazy, but if it's true, it will have to go to the courts. It's outrageously illegal. I'm afraid these people were judged and convicted a long time ago. I still hadn't seen who this voice belonged to, since he stayed on the far side of the tree. You're gonna have to tell me what's going on, or I won't go and take my chances here to see firsthand these things you're talking about. All right, but you might not like or believe what I tell you. The voice then went on to tell me how Dame's Point had once been a hub for the Atlantic slave trade. The mayor had even allowed it after it had been outlawed because of his greed. By night, ships would come in and unload their cargo, selling slaves by the moonlight. Then one day, they smuggled in a voodoo priestess from Jamaica. She was resistant and beaten worse than anyone ever had been. In her dying breath, she laid a curse on the whole town, declaring it to forever be bound in blood to its wretched ways. The townspeople laughed and spit on her while she passed from her wounds. But that very night, the bosses, who were apparitions of greed, tyranny, violence, and oppression, came out of the ocean with torches in their hands and laid the whip to everyone in town. Anyone caught in the town would forever be guilty and unable to escape the punishment of these vices, paid back tenfold. What does Artemis have to do with any of this? I asked. I had my suspicion that he was somehow the ringleader. That man is Satan incarnate, and that's all I'm going to say about Artemis, the voice replied. I could hardly believe my ears until the man stepped out from behind the tree. He showed me his wounds and where his back had been scourged open from the whippings, always festering and never healing. The sun was starting to get low in the sky, so I left my bag at the hotel, abandoned my car, and made my way up the trail behind the house on the hill. It wasn't soon after I hit the peak of the hill that the last rays of the sun were extinguished. I stopped for a moment, taken by a morbid curiosity, to see if what the man had told me was true. Sure enough, as soon as the light left the sky, a parade of torches, one at first and then many, came marching out of the sea. From the corner of my eye, I caught a glimpse through a window on the house that sat on the hill of a devilish orange glow erupting. As I turned to leave so as not to be caught up in what would happen next, I could hear the whips and screams coming from below. A tinge of guilt crept through my body for not being able to do something to save them from the evil they themselves had created. But furthermore, what still haunts me is, I know that there really is a hell on earth, and if you're not careful, you could end up there.